In this section, we're going to talk about how to conditionally access a resource. This is useful to conditionally download it as well as to conditionally update it. In order to do these conditional operations, your resource has to have associated with it what's called an e-tag, which is short for entity tag. Services can associate an e-tag with a resource in order to identify the version of the resource. Each time a resource updates or modifies itself, then its e-tag value would also change. The e-tag value usually is part of the, in the response header, comes back to the client in a response header called e-tag of all things. And then the client code can know when it received the resource that this is the e-tag or version that identifies that particular version of the resource. Now, to set the e-tag on the server, there are several different techniques that can be used. Some services will take the value of the resource and get some kind of checksum value or hash over it, and then use that to identify that version of the resource. Um, and we prefer that services do use a checksum um, over the resource so that the e-tag actually reflects the actual value of the resource itself. But sometimes computing a checksum or hash value is costly, and so you could just use a date, that is whenever the resource changes, just make the e-tag be the date or timestamp of that change. Or you could just use a sequence number, that every time the resource changes, it's now it's version one, version two, version three, and just keep monotonic, monotonically increasing the sequence number. And this e-tag is used for caching purposes, that is to conditionally read a resource only if it has changed, or to control concurrent writes. That means only update a resource if it hasn't changed. Um, and you should include the e-tag not only in the response header, but you should also include an e-tag field in the JSON as well if you decide you want to support these conditional access patterns uh, at all. And the reason why it's important to put the e-tag field in the JSON response is because if a customer goes to a collection and does a get operation on the collection where it returns multiple resources, the client side code will want to know the version of each of those. So the get response for the collection, you know, it doesn't make sense to put an e-tag in there for the collection as a whole, but for the items that are coming back, you want the e-tag of each of the items that comes back so that you can see what version number of each of those items you have. So at the bottom of the slide here, I show an example resource that has an e-tag field in it. Um, this would be in a response payload that comes back from the service. So just to be clear, the e-tags are always set by the service, never by the client, but they are set by the service when the client does an update or write operation to the resource. And then the service always returns the e-tag back to the client so the client can know what version of the resource they have. And here you can see this e-tag example is some hex number like 0x8c blah 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 um, and this could easily be some kind of checksum or, or it could be you know number of milliseconds or seconds since the start of an epic or something like that and then any additional fields would be in the uh, resource response as well so the e-tags are used for two typical purposes. The first is for resource caching, where a client that is caching a resource, it might periodically go back to the originating service where the resource originates and ask it, I, am, I need to get the new resource, but only if it has changed from before. So caching is useful really if the resource is large in size. And most services that I've had experience with working with, the resources are actually fairly small in size. And so this is not that useful for most of them. Um, and the reason why it's useful for resources that are large in size is because when a client asks a service, is there a new version? Um, normally it will return that new version back, which will be large. But if you're using this mechanism that I'm talking about now, then the client can say, only give me the data over the wire if the resource has changed. So then if it's a large resource, it won't be sent over the wire. If it's small enough, then the service might as well just send whatever it has and doesn't even have to pay attention to the e-tag at all because you're not gonna be saving much bandwidth if the resource is small. So the way that this works is a client will initially get a resource from the service along with its current e-tag. 
And then when the client wants to periodically call back to the service to see if the resource has changed, it will do another get request and it will include an if none match header with the old ETag value in the request. And then the service will check to see if the ETag that's being sent in this header matches the current ETag on the resource. And if the ETags match, that means that the resource on the service has not changed. It's the same exact version as what the client last had. So the resource has not changed, then the service can return a 304 not modified without sending the resource back in the payload. And that, again, the goal there is to save bandwidth. If the E tags don't match, that means the version on the service is different from the last version that the client got. So the client is now trying to get the latest version. So in this case, the, because the resource has changed, the server would return a 200 OK. And in the response body, it would include the payload. Of course, that will also include the latest E tag. So in the future, the client could update again using this most recent E tag that it got to see if the resource has changed again. So the client will periodically repeat this. And for more control over caching of resources, if this is something you're interested in, go and see the HTTP cache control header. But as I said, most services don't actually implement this because the resources tend to be rather small in size. The other reason to use ETag or do conditional access is because you might have multiple clients that are trying to update the same resource at the same time. And we want to have optimistic concurrency patterns in place in order to do that in a safe way so that one client doesn't overwrite or corrupt the data that's also being manipulated by a different client. So in order to not overwrite a resource, when you're doing a patch or put operation, right, these are write operations to the resource, you would include the if none match request header again, and then you could say star with no quotes or anything, just star. And that means that the put and patch is saying to the service, only do this if the, if the resource does not exist at all. So this is a way you could have a client write something, but not overwrite something that's on the server. And if the resource exists already, then the service should return a 412, uh, 412 precondition failed. And if the resource doesn't exist, then the service would go and return a 201 created or possibly a 200 OK, uh, because now it's creating the thing, the resource, and then it would return the latest resource in the response body along with the E tag that was created by the service to identify that this is the first version of the resource that's being created. To delete an existing resource, you can use the delete method along with the if match request header, again, of star. So this says from the client to the server, I want to delete this thing identified by the URL path, but only if it matches anything. That means only if it actually exists, right? The star is a wild card, mean match anything. So if the resource does exist, then the service would return a 200 OK or possibly a 204 no content, depending on whether you want to return the last state of the resource before you delete it to the client or not. And if the resource doesn't exist, then you would return again a 412 precondition failed. This last or this delete scenario is pretty unusual. Uh, most services will just accept a delete, will ignore the headers, and will delete the resource and always return a 200 or a 204 back. In fact, earlier in this uh, course, I talked about how why it's best not even to return a 404 if the resource doesn't exist. The other thing that you can do conditionally is you can update based on the current state. So here a client goes and gets the resource with its latest e tag, and then based on its current state, it does some kind of modification. I'll give an example of this on the next slide. And it modifies that resource locally on the client. But now the client needs to go and do a patch or a put operation to upload this back to the server. So it will send the desired resource state up to the server with a request header of if match colon with the e tag value. So what that is saying to the server is go and take this update, but only if the resource hasn't changed behind the client's back while it was busy doing some work. 
And if the E tags match, that means that the resource on the server has not been changed while the client was doing this desired state change. And then the service will update the resource, give it a new E tag value and return either 200 or 204 along with a new E tag value in the response header. And then if the E tags don't match, that means that the resource on the service has changed while the client was calculating some desired state, which means that the state is calculated by the client is no longer valid. So the, the service will return a 412 back to the client to say the, the resource has changed, your starting state was no longer valid. And then the client typically loops around at this point and then calls a, makes a get request again to get what is now the latest state of the resource, then performs its update, and then does its write back to the service. And we call this optimistic, this pattern is called an optimistic concurrency pattern. So I know that's a little bit difficult to follow. So I have a, um, on the next slide, I'll demonstrate how this really works. So let's say that on our service here, we have some bank accounts. There's a bank account for Aiden, there's a bank account for Grant, and there's a bank account for Jeff. And each of these bank accounts has an E tag on it, indicating how many versions or changes has been made. So the Aiden bank account, is, it's, it's using the sequential numbering pattern for this. The E tag says 23, which means there've been 23 versions of this. We're on the 23rd in the service. But let's focus on the Jeff account um, it's the very first version up there, and it currently has a balance of $100. Now, let's say we have two clients, and these two clients want to go and deposit money into Jeff's account. One of them client is going to deposit $23, and the other client wants to deposit $32. So altogether, we would be adding $55 to $100, so the final result should be $155. But what if these two clients are trying to update this account at the exactly same moment in time? Well, client number one and client number two, they both go to the service and they get the current version of the resource. So they both get back for the account Jeff that is currently at version one and it currently has a balance of $100. Now, both clients, they add their amounts to it. So client one adds a $23 and client two goes and adds a $32. Now these two clients are going to go back to the service. Well, when client one wants to write this back to the service, it says to the service, I have version one and I've modified it to $123, will you take it? And the service says, well, I had version one, you have version one, so that's a match. That means it did not change yet. And so your change to it is good, I will accept it. And so the service does accept this $123 and it increments the E tag of the resource on the service from one to two. But now client number two, it does the same thing and it writes this back to the service. But when it tries to overwrite the value on the service, it says, I had version one. And the service says, well, wait, somebody went behind your back and changed this. I'm now at version two. So that means the change that you made here to $132 is not valid. So the service refuses to accept that and here it would return the 412 precondition failed error back to client number two. At this point, client number two would have to loop around in its code and would make another get request to get the latest value. So now it knows that the latest value on the service for the Jeff account is version two and it currently has $123 in it. Client number two now performs the add operation to make it $155. And then it goes and sends this change back to the service. The service now says, well, you had version two, I'm also at version two, and so those match. I will now accept your change because I know you made the change based on the most recent state of the resource. And now we see that we do in fact have $155 in the account, and it was all because of E tags and using these if match headers to make sure that this optimistic concurrency pattern works correctly and that we don't end up with data corruption, right? Without using this pattern, we would have either ended up with $123 or $132 in the account, depending on which client got there first. And the other piece of information would have been erased and overwritten, so we would not have $155.